Has your company ever been confronted with a crisis situation? Have you had a cyber attack or been accused unjustly of sexual harassment? Or has your company been crushed on Yelp? Maybe you're lucky and never have been faced with a crisis situation. However, better be prepared and strategic in your communication than feel overwhelmed and be impulsive, which makes things worse. Expert David Oates will share with you how to be prepared for such a situation, a crisis situation. Welcome to the Excellent Executive Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Katrina Berus, and today we have Dave Oates, a crisis management expert. Dave, you're most welcome. Dr. Katrina, it is a pleasure to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Great. So give us examples of a crisis situation. What typical clients do you have that have crisis situations? I wish I could tell you that there is an archetype of the crisis client that I have, but it runs the gamut. And I'll explain why in a minute. But to answer your question specifically, I've had everything literally from a small veterinarian shop getting crushed on Yelp because a patient was not happy with the service up to managing the media relations and family communications for 55 skilled nursing facilities throughout California, Nevada, to professional sports teams dealing with an adverse matter of a top, very prominent employee, to U.S. Department of Justice investigations on defense contractors and points of between. But I think that the answer to your question is, what's a typical client? Really, there is none. And the reason for that is because of the way in which people get information now through their mobile devices, largely through a social media account like Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. And what that means is that any organization of any size can find their reputation being called into question and have to address it in a crisis PR mode because anyone anywhere can disparage their good reputation and their good name at literally the click of a phone icon. That's the reality of the world in which we live. So let's say an example that one of your clients or let's say a veterinarian finds that on Instagram, they said their dog was maltreated. What must you do in that kind of situation? What's the best I, I, reaction? Perfect question, because this really did happen. And the answer to that is we prepped the veterinarian after understanding the full case and the full facts behind the case, is to be ready to talk to the other clients, the fur parents, as I affectionately call them, being one myself, that were calling in after seeing this Instagram and, and social media posts and asking the veterinarian, understandably so, what's the story? Now, let's keep in mind, this veterinarian had a very, very good reputation up to this point. Very caring, very concerning, a lot of five-star ratings on Yelp and Google and Facebook. But anytime somebody calls that into question, you, know, you can expect that your clients are going to call. So what we did is we made sure that he was able to articulate all the facts in the case in a empathetic manner and an action-oriented manner, but one that didn't come with a great deal of defensive emotion. So it didn't sound like he was being... He was, you know, being called into something and now was, you know, spotlight was on him. Everybody gets nervous. Everybody panics. So what, what did he to, to show is that the customer. Tell customers us what he you, said then. What exactly did you advise him to say to not be defensive? So what what is a non-defensive way of reacting? First thing he said is, hey, I really appreciate the phone call. Thanks for being concerned about your fur child and what we do here. What happened was, is this person came in and didn't like a particular treatment that we had already recommended and signed. Can't go into details because of privacy concerns. But what we did afterwards is make sure that there was at least an understanding about what we could and couldn't do. And then we were able to effectively make, you know, at least come to some sort of agreement as to how we were going to move forward. That obviously wasn't good enough for this person who then wrote a scathing post. And, you know, we're dealing with that accordingly. But I hope this is the veterinarian now talking to the other customer have a better understanding as to what, what went on. And in those cases, all of the customers were in agreement. We're very happy to get that answer, felt like they had gotten the full story and didn't leave him for that one. But to your point, doctors, in addition to that, we had prepared him for what I'll call the gotcha questions, the questions that could come after that conversation to make sure that even in cases where 
somebody may be skeptical. Somebody may have an unconscious bias that he also didn't answer in a defensive way. When somebody is inquiring about something, it means that they care and that they're not understanding. And the first thing you need to do, whether it's a veterinarian or whether it's a big organization in a crisis situation, is acknowledge the question and the reason somebody asks that because they care and they are interested in finding out more because they want to believe you. They are not necessarily in a position where they want to just sever the relationship. Because if they did, if that was their intention, they wouldn't call you and ask you. They would just leave. And in these cases, we were telling them, customers that are calling you and asking that, you have to understand in the, in the back of your mind, they're calling because they care and they want to stick with you. And that helps diffuse any of the defensive emotions that most people have in a situation like this. Okay, very good advice. So really not being defensive, understanding that if they call, they're, the people care and want to be convinced. And it's tough when you have a, a matter where your reputation is being called into question, you know, business owners, executives, people in those statues, your, your profession is an extension of your personal identity. So you take this understandably personally. And when somebody is making an accusation that you've done something that's counter to your brand promise, we're humans, we're going to get defensive on that. And so I try to get people out of their mindset, because that's one of the big obstacles in being able to convey effectively what's going on, what you're doing about it in an empathetic and action-oriented manner. Because the reason you engage somebody like me or you engage in a crisis communication plan is because you want to get back to normal operations as quickly as possible and preserve as much of the reputation that you can and give yourself the opportunity to repair it. And I think we did so in the veterinarian case, which is just one example. Do you have another example to share with us? I have one. I've got several. There was another one where I had a small defense contractor that was in the construction space that the owners who had started another business turned over operations to this person who essentially created and secured contracts that were not in compliance with DOD regulations for specific contracts that are set aside for minorities, women, people of color. And ultimately, the Justice Department came back and filed a civil suit for which the owners had to pay a nice seven-figure settlement wow. to make that happen. Now, thankfully, they were successful enough that it was expensive and it hurt, but it wasn't. It didn't mean the end of the business. But it made regional news because of the footprint that this business had and the owners, the owner's stature in that company. And so we had put out not only statements to the press, but we made overtures to the business community and one-on-one -on -one to other clients. Now the owner said, you know, we certainly didn't intend to do anything wrong. We did, however, take our eye off the ball by allowing somebody to be able to run the day-to-day -day operations. We should have had better control about that. We apologize. We have taken steps to make sure that this doesn't happen again. This has been a painful lesson to us and we're moving forward. And in doing so, what happened was they did not lose their ability to go after new contracts and other contracts that they secured through the proper methods uh, they were able to keep. Because in many cases, when something like that happens, it's particularly in the government contracts, the, all the other contracts that you have, whether you got them legitimately or not, will get severed and your business is gone overnight. They were able to preserve it because of the authenticity that they expressed in their communications to the business community, to other clients, to their team members, and to the media. And uh, they're still a company that's going. And, and thankfully, it's, it's a lesson that's now been learned and the event is in the past. So basically, they admitted a mistake that was not intended and told the public that they would take care of it. Correct. Even though the owners themselves didn't commit the fraudulent acts, it was somebody that they hired. They said, as we've heard, you know, from the history books with Harry Truman, the buck stops here. This was something we didn't do. This is our mistake. And we're paying a painful monetary price for that. But please know that we're moving forward. And here's the thing. Most people will give organizations and individuals a second chance if they are forthright, authentic, empathetic, and action-oriented in their response. We all... Even in this day of social media rants and raves and the vitriol that seems to be consuming us, we still give people a second chance because we understand what it's like to be in their shoes. 
you just have to be that open and that transparent to the best that you can in most cases. And this takes organizations and, and executives and people out of their comfort zone, right? We get very defensive again, because we feel like our integrity gets called into question. And so we panic and we get defensive and that's just human nature. And so I spend a lot of my time trying to take my clients out of their comfort zone with the idea to say, let's find the quickest path to get through this, preserve your entity, nonprofit, for-profit, your personal brand, and you can continue on there. And then we'll, we'll be able to shore up whatever the you know misgiving was again not through malice just through you know maybe it was just simply you trusted somebody too much and moving forward and i'm proud to say i've got a pretty good track record for that so what happens if let's say a leader is accused of harassment or sexual abuse or whatever that is what's happening with a lot of companies so what do you suggest <laughs> there it's a real tough situation that unfortunately I think more and more organizations will find themselves in. And I'll get to the answer to your specific question, but to put it in context, right? There's what exacerbates that is in many cases, you're not able to, because of privacy considerations, be able to discuss the matter openly. You can't go into details because you can't disclose that kind of information. But the, the cardinal rules of any sort of accusation of sexual harassment, whether they're founded or not, is you must express a empathy toward the individual who feels, whether you think it's valid or not, who felt that they needed to voice their objection and their pain and that you take it seriously. First and foremost is you take it seriously and don't show any emotion on trying to counter the narrative or to say immediately, we emphatically deny this. Even if the allegations are completely false, do not lead with that. You can certainly include that in your statement, but you first need to talk about the, the seriousness of the allegations and that you recognize that and you take it seriously. If the allegations are truly unfounded, then the next step is to say, we will certainly go through all the proper channels to make sure that everybody's voices are heard. We're confident that we did nothing of the sort, but we will let the process play out. In other words, don't start to counter the accusations with other stories, because all that will do is give the audiences an impression that you're victim shaming and will substantiate whatever the claim was. And so it's sort of counter to intuitive to people who are in executive positions who feel like they're being unfairly disparaged and they will counter it with an equal and opposite fervent force, but that never works. You're okay, to just give us an example of countering it. So again, when you have a situation where you're being accused of something, as I just mentioned, By like sexual harassment, to just to make it, it as concrete as possible, yes? Yeah, so the sexual harassment is you take it seriously, you talk about you want to make sure everybody gets voices heard, and that we will cooperate with all entities, including an independent third party investigation to make sure all the entities are heard, make sure everybody has a voice, make sure everybody has an input. We are confident that we did nothing of the sort, but we don't want to be in a position where, where we're giving the appearance that we're stifling somebody's ability to be heard, and we will honor that. What you don't want to do is immediately come out with a statement that says, the allegations are completely untrue, and here's the other things you should know about this person and how they act around other people and how they correspond, and we've had allegations for this person doing nasty things up to this point and all that other jazz, that's the wrong approach. And that's the approach a lot of business owners take. And it just looks like you're victim shaming. It looks like you're defensive. It will, and it'll have the opposite effect. People will say, oh, they're arguing so much that the allegations must be true. I see. Very interesting. Okay. So those are the things you're starting to tell us things not to do in a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, the big things to not do is to get is what I call get into a fight or flight mode. So, you know, leaders, entities, executives, they all are successful in their own right in large part because they possess two characteristics. And there's many more from that. But if you distill down, no matter what the industry, no matter what the profession, no matter what the type of work that they do, they're successful because they've ignored the naysayers throughout their career. They have persevered on their own to believe in themselves and then when somebody has thrown an obstacle in front of them, they barrel their ways through it. So ignoring the naysayers is kind of flight, just tune them out. And 
fighting through something and not being afraid to get to get scrappy when somebody throws an obstacle to barrel over that. I call that the fight or flight mode. The fight mode is when you argue. And if somebody in this case is making accusations, the executive will think we use that as an obstacle or the entity and we'll start to counterpunch in a very, very fierce and fervent and emotional a way. Counterpunch or, for our European listeners are as, uh, is start to argue, right? Start to get argumentative, start to do exactly as I said beforehand, start to refute the person, start to talk about how nasty this individual is and get personal and those kind of things. And then, or they'll do what I said is in the flight mode, which is they will say nothing. They will not make a comment on that. And when you don't make a comment on that, you give audiences the impression that the other person is right, or at the very least, you don't care what they say. And either way, you look unfeeling and distant and will give credence to the accusations that are being made in front of them. So what we tell people to do is you have to express, as I said before, empathy and action. I don't care what the crisis is. I don't care where it is in the world. Expressing empathy and action is important. And that's why in the case of a sexual harassment claim, you have to express empathy for the seriousness of the situation and the desire in an action form to make sure that you create an investigative arm that all parties will be heard and will be heard in their entirety, even though you're obviously more, you're obviously 100% confident that you've done nothing wrong and that the investigation and the ensuing litigation will prove that. But you want the process to be continued and everybody to have a voice because that shows you're not afraid to hear the other side knowing full well you didn't do anything wrong and you're being empathetic to the fact that somebody is now feeling disenfranchised and you want them to be empowered with going through the process, even if you know in your complete heart of hearts that they're wrong. Yes, you mentioned also when you have a crisis situation, so that you should prepare or inform your employees before anybody else. Can you comment mm -hmm. on that? Most organizations get this wrong. When they think of a crisis, they think of a news organization somewhere in their backyard or around the world who calls in to ask about a particular matter because they're going to put this story online or in a broadcast or things like that. And they'll go and address them before they address anybody internally. And I would submit your employees, no matter the crisis, are your first priority because they are the first people that your rest of your audience is engaged, all your customers, your partners, your investors, your other stakeholders in the business, we will have conversations more often than not, first and foremost, with somebody on your team. And they must be empowered by understanding what is going on, what the company is doing about it, and be in a position where they can ask questions, if not by the CEO or the C-suite, somebody in a leadership capacity or supervisor or something like that who's empowered for that. So I tell organizations, before you put out a press release, before you post something on social media to address the crisis, make sure that your employees are informed and engaged and have the opportunity to at least have a conversation with you. And now, that doesn't mean that you have to wait a day or two days or certainly an hour to do so, but your first communications out from an executive team needs to be the employees. And then 10, 15 minutes later, get the information out directly to your customers, to your partners, to your investors or donors, if you're a nonprofit, and then to the general public through your social media and press release and whatever. Most organizations get it wrong. And what happens is your employees will not understand what's going on. And when customers start calling in and investors and business partners start calling in, the employees are not going to know what to say. They'll probably say something off the cuff and they'll be not happy that they've been placed in a position to and set up for failure. So they'll be disenfranchised and likely undercut anything you've said in the public domain anyway. Yes, yeah, so that's which is super dangerous as well. Mm -hmm, very much so. So really engaging the employees and first of all, informing them, answering their questions, preparing them if the press goes directly to them so that everyone's aligned with the key message to be given. So Correct, it, right? can, can you yep. prepare a crisis situation before any crisis happens? Absolutely. And in fact, I would submit that any organization of any size needs to at least prep for what could happen. You mentioned sexual harassment. Like it or not, that is a situation that many organizations of any size will likely face. And again, it doesn't mean that there is anything nefarious going on. It could be a misunderstanding. It could be a misuse of a word, not with any intent on 
disparaging somebody or making somebody feel inferior or not welcome and, and not valued in a workplace. We all make mistakes on that one. But I think prepping for those occurrences would be smart for any organization. I think another one that every organization needs to have in their back pocket from a crisis PR plan is the likely event that they will be the victim of a cyber attack, ransomware or some other entity that is incredibly common and cyber thieves do not discriminate against the big companies versus the small companies and the small organizations. Everyone's a target if you've got access to the internet. And that's just the reality of that. And then for different organizations, depending on the industry, I think you can think about other factors. I think if you're in the manufacturing business, what happens if something goes wrong at the plant? What happens if in as a distributor, you have a transportation accident of some sort? If you are in the services industry, and let's say I'll say the hospitality industry, what happens with a guest that has an adverse event and sometimes really horrific events on your property. You have so many different customers that come into your home. How are you going to address that if something goes on there? And then there's just a litany of other things to work on. But I would submit to you that there are enough examples of organizations that just by their existence have the potential to be the victim of a cyber attack or other matters that warrant a crisis communications preparation plan. You can absolutely plan for those and you can train for those so that it's not a big surprise if it happens. So let's say some uh, company has a cyber attack. Would you advise mm-hmm. similar recommendations, acknowledge what has happened, call the clients to inform them and you know, say that you're addressing the issue as quickly as possible, something like that? Yeah. In fact, in many parts of the world, Europe, North America and the like, it's required that you do that. And you have to do it a certain way. And so there's laws that will tell you to do so. But even beyond the laws, I think that there are steps and there are processes that you can take to do so. I wrote an ebook that with a terrific attorney in the United States out of Atlanta, where we basically give the playbook for any organization to say, what do you do in the case of a ransomware attack? How do you get the right teams in place? How do you set up a communication strategy? How do you execute that communication strategies? What are you doing the follow-ups for that and when? And I would welcome the opportunity for any organization to download that because I think it's vital and likely. I, let, let's, I want to underscore that. If there's two things that I think any organization will likely be the target of, it's a cyber attack like ransomware and a sexual harassment claim. Those are the two ones that if you look at the, my day-to-day you know, conversations I have with clients, you know, at least half of what I work on are in one of those two categories. So we're coming to the end of our podcast. What would you advise someone that has been attacked in the cyber attack? That's just one tip that you can give. And then the other question is, where can they download your playbook? I appreciate that. The cardinal rule is get your communications out to customers, to employees and to partners as fast as you can as to what you're experiencing. And and the sooner you can do that, the better. The longer you wait for that, And the more that customers find out about themselves because they can't access your portal, they can't find you on the website, your emails get bounced back, the more that you will create anxiety and uncertainty that will cause people to start thinking about going elsewhere. And that is a big no-no. Now, a little caveat, there are some laws that will say, and legal people that will say, you don't want to disclose everything because... There's legal liability for that, depending on where you are in the world. And I recognize that. But there needs to be, this is why the planning is so important, because you need to have an understanding with all the players involved as to what they need and where their perspective is as opposed to communications and come to a resolution on that. And the time to figure out what to say and when to say and how to say it should be agreed upon by all the parties and not while the cyber attack is going on. You are There's way too much chaos during the event to figure that out. Time to figure out at least what you will do in a general sense is when you don't have a cyber attack. And and that's why planning is so important. Great, wonderful advice. Where can people get a hold of you? And I didn't answer your second question. The ransomware ebook, you can look me up. Dave Oates is on Amazon for a quick download. It's on Kindle. Would love to see folks take advantage of that. And then myself, my company's website, PR Security Service, is on the website at publicrelationssecurity.com, publicrelationssecurity.com. 
I'm Dave Oates on LinkedIn. I put weekly video blogs on there about a wide range of circumstances and events that are going on there and where I take it from a crisis PR perspective and what they did right and what they could have done better. And I would love to hear from as many people as are listening and connect with them and, and be a resource. I appreciate the time. Thank you very, very much, Dave. Most interesting. And I hope that people download your playbook because that is super useful. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dr. Pleasure. We would love to know what you thought of this podcast. Write us an email at drkatrina, with a K, at excellentexecutivecoaching.com. We would love to hear what you liked and what we could improve. This podcast has been sponsored by ExcellentExecutiveCoaching.com. Thank you for listening to the Excellent Executive Coaching Podcast. You can subscribe to all future podcasts at ExcellentExecutiveCoaching.com. Join us each Wednesday to learn more about the latest trends in leadership techniques and bring your coaching to the next level. To learn more about Dr. Burris' CEO Mastermind, use the contact form at excellentexecutivecoaching.com.